just start. Yeah, just start. Anyway. Hello, good morning. That's here to wake you up all this morning. <clears throat> yes, very good morning to you. Um, if you are standing, um, yeah, please do get to your seats because we are about to start our worship service. Yes, yeah, so okay, very good morning to all of you that are here at uh, BC Central. Um, my name is Matt, I'll be your host for this morning, and a very, very warm welcome to those of you who are viewing from online. If you are um, viewing online or whether you're here, um, you should be given um, one of these cups because um, we will have communion service here this morning. So for those of you who are online, please do get prepared with um, a cup and some bread as well um, as we'll be having um, communion service together during worship this morning. Okay, so I think a few of us might be a little bit, uh, a little bit tired from um, Kairos. Uh, who, who went to Kairos yesterday? Anyone who went to Kairos? I, I went, yes, I've seen Kang with his hand up. Um, so we might be a little bit, so we just need a bit of a warm-up. We'll, uh, I'm sure we'll be wide awake when we get to um, towards worship. So, yeah, let's, let's get started with the worship service. So we'll get the worship team to come up. We've got uh, a, four, a three strong team um, this morning. So, uh, yeah, we'll hand over to Christabel, Hannah, and Jason. start with some worship and I'll start with a quick prayer. <laughs> um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can come together as a church family and we can come and worship you. Thank you that we have the freedom in this country to do so um, and what a joy it is to be able to yeah, freely worship you. So God, we just pray now that you would um, yeah, just prepare our hearts to um, encounter you and just uh, meet you today. Um, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. 
we just thank you so much that, um, yeah, what a joy it is to come and praise you, Lord. And we just thank you that, um, yeah, for your great love that you came and died for us. And we pray that we would just, um, yeah, really soak that in and um, as we stand before your cross and just think that the Lord of all creation came to earth and died for us. How amazing and incredible your love is for us.
So thank you to Chris Bell and the worship team for leading this morning's worship. Right, okay, so again, uh, for those who just come in, a very, very warm welcome to you all for to coming here to BCC, to the English service. My name's Matt, I'm here to host you this morning, and it's really great to see all of you here, despite, you know, what's going with the rain outside. So uh, let's find our day, let's see what is heading up uh, for the church um, this week and uh, for the future weeks. Uh, first of all, we're going to watch a video, so let's see the next instalment um, of the series. Wow, what an amazing story. And uh, that is what Explorers Group will be learning more um, this morning. So uh, parents, please do sign um, your children um, to the various different Explorers Groups. Those of you who are unfamiliar with this, um, there are three different groups that are going on. So the, um, the little group is for Peace Conception. Alex is there at the back. Um, the orange group... Um, very similar things. There's the junior group and there's the grand group. The junior is led by Mandy. That's uh, years one to three. And in years four to seven is led by Theodora with the orange shirt. So please do sign your kids in. And then please do sign them out once it ends. So they can share what has been going explorers and all the different things that they have done. So whilst the parents sign the kids in, let's um, look at a few new... Different news and notices. There's quite a bumper schedule of news and notices this week, so do listen carefully with this. Um, so next week, um, Josh will be um, doing a sermon on how is Jesus Lord in my education and career. So very, very, very relevant to whether it's um, students or teachers like myself or those of your parents, um, or even if you're at work. It's um, one that you definitely cannot miss. So definitely uh, come to next week, either morning or evening. Um, What's up next? We have, oh, before you play. Um, so um, we're going to play a video. So, um, so there is an AGM coming on the 18th of May. This is for uh, members that uh, have got the invitation. Um, and we're going to watch a video. Uh, it's by Rachel Chan. So she's going to be going to the Cantonese front and she'll be working with like um, family support. So those for the elderly um, and for women. So um, we'll watch this video. Um, this is her Canada video. And then um, in the AGM, be able to vote, um, you know, whether we want, um, we're going to accept her to join the master door team. Uh, sharing um, her testimony video. Um, so she has spoken um, last week in the Cantonese worship uh, meetings. Um, so some of you might be familiar with her already, um, but we'll be voting her in, as well as Eric, um, who's also um, going for a more prominent role um, at BC South. So um, that's just one of the few agenda items that are there for the 18th May. So please do make sure you save that date on a diary. It will take place online in the evening. Right, next bit we got is, uh, is Fat Camp. So you, some of you might um, recognize quite a few people here. I'm, I'm somewhere, somewhere lurking somewhere. Um, so um, those of you who are um, youth, uh, teens, more like. So if you're in year 7 to 13, that's true. If you are in year 7 to 13, um, places are almost, almost, almost full. So please, if you haven't yet signed up, please sign up ASAP. I think the form was just released again um, you know, yesterday. So um, do sign up um, for the camp. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, I served as a, um, as a, as a leader um, last year. Very, very enjoyed it. And... Um, yeah, and those who are wanting to lead, um, please also do um, sign up as well. So, um, yeah, great way to, um, to go deeper and know more about Jesus. Um, and it will take place at Wymore Lakes, um, same place last year. Um, and there might be some outdoor activities, I, I, I hear. So I think this year, just a little bit more. Um, if you are not a teenager and actually you're in primary school age, then, next bit, we have this for you. Okay, so... Uh, primary school children, okay, um, this is held at, at, at here, this, um, at this site at BC Central. Okay, it's led by a team from Toronto. Um, it's a kids from a VBS. There is a form at the back, which looks a bit like this. Okay, so if you um, haven't yet signed up and you want to sign up, please get a form from the back. 50 quid per child, definite bargain, and it's, it will last for, you know, a week as well. So uh, 29 to the second, so five days of absolute fun, and they'll, again, go deeper into knowing more about Jesus. Um, so we get into um, giving, so I'll ask the, um, the welcome team to, um, to come up and, and do the offering. So offering is uh, another form of worship, okay? So if this, this is your first time here, please, um, there's no blow to give, please do let them pass them by. Um, 
there's different ways, again, just to remind you of um, giving. So you, um, you've got the traditional bags, you've got online as well. And don't forget, there's several different funds as well. So you've got the traditional English fund, but don't forget there's also one for missionaries, uh, one for the building, okay, and also there's any other purposes, obviously, um, we will let you informed. And if you are a UK taxpayer as well, please don't forget to fill in a gift aid form. It is at the back. If you need to speak any more about this, um, do uh, catch up with me um, at the end, and I will uh, give you some guidance on that one. So um, there we go. Thank you very much, offering team. Um, so um, as I kind of indicated earlier when I was um, talking about um, Josh's sermon next week, um, some of you might be going through exams right now. So if you are if you are taking IB, a very, very good luck to you. I know you might have just started already. Um, I know that um, those in primary school think they're doing it um, in around three, two weeks' time, two to three weeks, and then some of you in year 11, 13, you've got yours again in three, you know, three to four weeks, and then obviously can't forget university students as well, which they might start you know, again really soon or started already. Um, so it'd be good to just spend time together just to pray um, for the students, for the parents, for the teachers. So we're going to pray um, in all three fronts. So let's just um, have a moment just to pray to God um, through, um, through education. Yeah, dear Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for, um, for the love that you've given us um, through, through this time and, um, and for the grace you've given that, you know, how, you know, Jesus, you know, how he died on the cross just, just for us. We just cannot thank you the sacrifice that he has given um, Lord, um, we know that at this point, it's a, a very, you know, it's a tough time um, for, for students, um, you know, wh whatever age you are, you know, whether in primary school, whether in secondary, and especially with, um, you know, all things going on in the past, you know, um, whether it's, you know, still with COVID going on um, or, you know, through other um, different circumstances, whether it's going on, things going on at home or things going on at school. Um, I just pray to God for, for the students, though, that you provide them with a sense of, with a sense of calm, Lord. Uh, I pray, Lord God, that Holy Spirit, that you will fill them as they, um, you know, as they um, face these exams. You know, all these exams all feel like mountains, but Lord, we know that you, you are, you reign supreme, that you, you, can, you can move mountains. And I just pray, Lord God, for the students so that, you know, they don't just, just rely um, on, on their own sort of own wisdom and stuff, but actually, God, you will provide them with uh, with the wisdom um, in order to for them to um, to see to see these exams, you know, whether it's you know one exam or whether it's twelve, or I know some might do sixteen or twenty exams. Um, we know it's not uh, it's not a sprint; it is a marathon. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord God, for the students, you provide them with um, with the strength um, throughout, and you provide them with adequate time to rest as well, um, and also just where you'll continue to love for them as well as, um, you know, th there might be, you know, there could be setbacks, you know, sometimes my exam might not go so well, but it's okay because, um, as I said, Lord, um, you provide them with a sense of calm. I also pray, Lord God, for their parents as well as they, um, you know, they support their child. I uh, just pray, God, for the parents that, you know, their anxieties as well. Uh, we know that, you know, as naturally as, um, you know, Chinese parents or Asian parents, um, that or any other uh, parent that we want, you know, we want the, their children to do really, really well. And I just pray, Lord God, that you will cast, you know, all the anxieties are there. We just pass them to to you, Lord, and um, that Lord, you will, um, yeah, as as you know, as Philippians says, that we, you know, we can't just work uh, rely on their strength, we rely on your strength as well. So just pray, Lord God, that yeah, that you provide them with that um, sense of calm throughout. Also, I pray, Lord God, for um, for the teachers as well. Um, pray for pray for all um, the teachers involved in the education sector. Um, you know, like myself, you know, who works in in the school dealing with lots of people doing their GCSE and math, A level math exams, but also all the other exams that are um, that are going ahead. And I pray, Lord God, that yeah, um, that you continue to provide us as teachers um, with that um, crucial sort of wisdom to continue to just provide the guidance to be there as sense of um, as sense of a men being a mentor and just to equip us with, you know, all the different circumstances that we might face um, when the students interact with the teachers. So I just pray to God that you will you provide them, the teachers, with, with the love and the grace as well um, that uh, we can then show 
um, to be shown to the students. And I pray, God, that in this time that you can, um, that you can give us, um, you know, we can also be, uh, become that way, be uh, ambassadors of Christ as well. Um, so, yeah, I just pray, Lord God, for, um, for the teachers, for the parents, and for the students as well um, as we get through this, you know, this two-month to two to three month period of exam seasons that are going. So I just pray this in your most special name we pray. Amen. So we're going to hand over to Bert. He will talk about um, how she's Lord in that. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, actually, we, for this, re- this announcement didn't show up on the, on the site, so, uh, but this is an important one. It's actually there's road closures next week. Um, there's a great Birmingham run next week. So uh, that in the dark red. So our church is actually right. Yeah, that's yeah yeah. Is that yeah? That's kind of uh, yeah 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 yeah. There there somewhere it's on this map. Um, we're behind the mailbox, so it means the road behind our church is closed. Uh, and then so you we can't you so my guess. But it will open by noon, I think. So it's only closed, that road's only closed in the morning. Um, so it means that when you drive down this way, you have to make a right turn down there to get out. And so there'll be road closures. So just be aware of that. You might want to come a bit earlier. There's some people in our congregation that's running in this. Uh, it's a, both a 10K and a half marathon. So the blue, dark blue down there, that's part of the, that's also going to be road closures as well. So if you come up from Pershore Road, that's going to be closed. Or if you're coming up, from the east side, you just be aware that some roads will be closed. Um, yeah, the full list of road closures, if you scroll up to the top, is this list. And those are the times. Oh, yeah, see? Here are the times where they're closed. So most of them should be reopened by 1230, and they're closed from, like, 8 to 1230. So those are the ones right Upper Dean Street. and I Actually, I don't know where any of these streets are. But... You, you can look it up. If they look familiar to you, know that that road might be closed. Uh, but so uh, try to come to church earlier because, I mean, we start so late anyways. You guys might as well be up at 7 and be here by 8 o'clock. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it'll be great uh, if you guys can make it out here uh, as well. Uh, and then those road closures should be open by 1230, so hopefully the Cantonese and the Mandarin congregations will be less affected. Um, yeah, but... Yes, that's a very important one. So when you show up next week, you won't be like panicked and figure out what's happening. Um, okay, um, we're gonna jump on to uh, today's message now, and it is on how is Jesus Lord uh, in this broken world. Um, and so let me tell you the story. Uh, so years ago, when I was in Sheffield, uh, my wife's best friend, uh, Becky, she used to work in this uh, youth ministry with me. And we'd meet at her house, me and the rest of the team, Adrian and this guy, Sam. And one day, I was like, oh, I'm going to be helpful. I'm going to wash the dishes after she made tea for us. And as I was washing the dishes uh, and washing a plate, I dropped, I dropped a plate in the sink, and it broke. And uh, you know, I felt really bad. I felt really bad. And she looked at me and said, oh, it's OK. It's OK. It was just part of a set. Right, that's, and it's, 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 it's the worst, right? Because you know, it's, it's one thing to have a broken plate. It's another thing to know that, that that's part of a set of things, right? And you're like, oh, now that set is broken. Like, it's incomplete. And I can't just, you can't just replace it. And I felt so bad. I felt so bad. I was like, oh, and there's nothing I can do to fix this situation. I can't find, I'd like, eBay was not that popular back then. These are years ago. And, you know, I didn't know. I was, it was just nothing I could do but apologize. And, and I, think, I think there's something very important about understanding when things are broken or things are broken out of set. You know something's wrong. The amazing thing about broken is when you look at something broken, you go, oh, that's not the way that should be. Um, it should be like this instead. Um, so when we look at the world and we see all the brokenness in it, um, it, it's frustrating because you look at oh, there's a petrol station, but it's all broken. There's a natural disaster. It's all ruined. It, it shouldn't be this way. It should be repaired. Um, or you look at a hall, hallway that's all, like, burnt out, and you're like, oh, how did this happen? Why is this the case? Um, or other natural disasters in the world that, that destroy areas, and you think, gosh, how, yeah, 
you can look at all these things, and if you look at any, you know, you look on the news, you see deforestation, or you see uh, huge mining, or you see the effects of war and brokenness of war. All of that, when you look at it, you're like, that's not the way it should be. And, and that's so important. There should be something in us every time we see something broken to be like, ooh, but it shouldn't be that way. And we know that because in our heads, there is a picture of what is right and what should be right. Like when we see riots and you feel the fear or you think things are breaking down, there should be this discomfort in us knowing that there's something broken in the system. And so when we talk about brokenness, we're not just talking about broken plates or broken cups or breaking a set. We're also thinking broken things in society, injustice, tensions, things like racial, and this is from a Black Lives Matter protest. You, you get the sense of like there's, there's racial injustice and, and there's sides that are trying to fight against this. And you don't even know where to place blame necessarily because it's so broken. The flip side of brokenness, and, and what I keep trying to draw out, is that there's, there's something that echoes in our heart that there must be something right. There must be something that means it's not supposed to be this way. And so for a lot of people who aren't Christians, or even for those of us who are Christians, our question is, how can Jesus be Lord in this world so broken? And actually, most of our time, our question becomes, how can Jesus allow this brokenness to happen? And, and because of that, we get frustrated and we're like, well, I don't want to believe in Jesus because if Jesus was Jesus, then he wouldn't let this brokenness happen. But the reality is actually all this brokenness points us to the fact that essentially sin has broken everything. But that yearning for something to be right, that hope, where does that come from? Where does that knowledge that things should be right come from? It comes from our own goodness, our own morality. That's can't be right because everything that that rages inside of humans seems to want to push towards breaking more things that righteousness that desire for something greater something to be in the right place that's god trying to echo into our hearts that there is a truer more righteous way that we were designed for and he wants us to call us into that Something broken always reminds us that's not the way it's supposed to be. So like this bike, you look at this bike, and you know like, oh, I'm not going to ride that bike because it's broken. But in, in a simple picture like this, you're like, okay, all I need to do is buy a wheel and change it and fix it. Um, and it can be usable again. Or, of course, this thing which haunts me. That's not a picture of the actual plate, but haunts me, this fact that I break, I broke, there's a plate broken. You know, and, and, and you know, you... You know, some people say, oh, I'll use that Japanese gold thing and, like, kitsugi. Thanks. And, like, make it, and the kind of redeem, redeem it, right? <laughs> but even then would know that there's still this brokenness, right? Brokenness, brokenness should move us to sorrow, to grieve, to yearn for it to be different. Like, when we see something broken, there should be something in our heart like, yeah, I don't want to be that way. Like, like the parent trap, right? Like I'm going to keep bringing up this movie, The Parent Trap. Like, you see this broken relationship. You want to bring them back together. I, okay, I, to be fair, I did finish watching The Parent Trap last week. And I cried so much. I cried way too much for this film. Anyways, there's this yearning that, oh. Oh, yeah, I cry because I, I, I'm yearning that things should be right. So when we think broken relationships or broken families or even your s institutions are broken, there should be this yearning in us, this grieving, this desire to say, God, don't, don't let it sit this way. Don't let it keep staying this way. And our passion should really be pushing for God. I really want to be different. But the problem is sometimes we get so used to the brokenness that we just accept it. And you hear that so often, right? Well, that's just the way it is, isn't it? That's just it. And it's, and it's horrible when Christians do that to you. Well, that is just the nature of sin. We live in a sinful world, and that's just how it's going to be. When you do that, you become so, so complacent, so numb to the tragedy of this world. And as Christians, we should be the, we, that should never happen to us because we know the goodness and the glory of God. Our hearts should always be breaking to say, like, gosh, they shouldn't have to stay in these broken situations. And yet sometimes we get so numb to it. 
so this is my friend's Porsche. I, I blocked out the pictures of them in the background. This is my friend. I, I feel like the Porsches and Parent Trap come a lot in my, in my talks. This is my friend's Porsche. And uh, so let me tell you about my friend. So he, uh, he's, a, he's a tall, skinny guy. He looks kind of like um, that singer. I don't remember. Anyways, anyways, he, he also sings. So he bought this Porsche. He bought this Porsche. He, and his Porsche was an old one that needed a lot of work. And it had a hole in the bottom of it. So you could see the road while you were driving. Like, it's almost like a Flintstones car, right? Um, there's a part that had, so apparently in a Porsche, if the water collects in a place, it actually rusts, and so a hole had opened up. But he's like, but still a Porsche. And, uh, and he'd just drive it, and he'd just accept that. Now, you would think that's bad, but his first car, his first car, he had been driving for so long, um, the radio only works if you open the, the, the driver's side door. So we would, he would come to a stoplight, then he would open the door and listen to the music, and then the light would turn green and close the door and would drive off again. And, and you'd look at it and you'd say, hey, man, I think that's broken, okay? That's not, your, your other car has a hole in it. I, I feel like that's really affecting its structural integrity. But you get used to it. You're like, well, you know, I, that's, that's okay. You know, it's, it's not that broken. It's not that bad. We can still deal with it and live with it. And we do that because we have to, there's so many things that are broken in our, in our society, in our life, that we do get used to it. The problem isn't that we get used to it. The problem is that we accept it. We accept that that's just the way it is. Sin is just the accepted way of life and how it should be. I think, I think for us as Christians, that's, that's the most dangerous place for us to hang out with. We start getting comfortable with sin or comfortable with brokenness in society and just accepting, oh, well, I'll just wait till Jesus comes. Or I'm just, I say this too much too as well, I'm just going to die and I'll go to heaven. So whatever. That's, that's horrible because what it does is it takes us out of this world that we're living in. It takes us out of what God desires for this world and lets us just become essentially selfish. And why is it worse for us as Christians? Because we have the hope of Jesus. Because all of us have been redeemed from some brokenness in our life already. And he's put us on this path that has such a different outlook, such a different peace, such a different joy. And yeah, there are some times where we don't feel great or it's not awesome, but we always know who we can turn to and rely on. And we get so complacent that we're like, yeah, that's just, well, that the parts of society didn't have to deal with it. Whereas we walk around with this amazing gift. The other thing that we try to do is we just try to patch up just a little bit just to make it last a little bit longer. So I got these glasses in Taiwan. Um, and so I was like, oh, look, I got plastic glasses that have nose pads. Ooh, I'm ready for Asian faces with small noses. And so I got these. And my mom, and the reason I got these glasses is because my mom said, you have to get glasses in Taiwan because it's better because it's made in Taiwan. It's like, oh, yeah. To be fair, it was. Except um, as, like, within, I moved back here. And uh, what happened was I, I bumped them somewhere, and I snapped off this, this side. So this my glasses, they snapped off this whole arm, its plastic arm. And I remember putting a photo on my Instagram saying, oh, can this be fixed? And, oh, Rachel, who's here, was like, no, you can't because it's plastic. Oh, that's too bad. And I said, yeah, you think so? I'm going to super glue it. So, uh, so I super glued it, uh, and it lasted for a little bit. and broke again. I super glued it again. Um, and so I've done this now about seven times. I've emailed my mom, and she said, uh, well, you can, uh, or you can try sending it back. I said, no, it's okay. I'll keep super gluing it. And it was really great. And then this week, um, I was playing some indoor basketball with my son, and I broke the other side. I broke the other side. So, uh, so I super glued it. So I super glued it because I'm like, oh, it works so well. And at this point now, um, the, when I, the glasses are now extending so far out because there's so much super glue <laughs> in between. And I just keep telling myself, it's fine. It's still workable. What's, what's funny is I know this side that I super glued is, is off. So I know my <laughs> I have to wear my glasses. I have to slightly tilt them because I know it's, it's not. So I'm really, really just resting them on my nose. And these things are just making sure they don't fly off my face. It's, but I've accepted it. I'll do whatever I can to make it last just a little bit longer because I think 
I'll just patch up the bare minimum so that I can keep surviving. And I think for a lot of us, this is how we deal with brokenness. We just get used to that. And in doing so, we lose sight of actually how great our God is or what he is capable of doing. Today, to try to unpack this, I'm just going to look at this passage in Romans. And in Romans, Paul is setting out this whole picture of of actually how great our God is, how, how sin has steeped us and pushed us so far away from him. But by his amazing grace and his love, he brings us back into this relationship with him. Okay, and that's the starting point. The starting point is that you are all so broken. Everything is so broken that nothing you can do could ever get you back to God. But God, by his amazing grace and his love, makes a way through Jesus Christ for us to be redeemed. Like redeemed is, redeemed is a great word because actually it's not just, it's not just partial redemption. It's not like, oh yeah, I'm just going to super glue a bit of him and then I'll let him into heaven. No, to, to, to be welcomed into heaven, you need to be completely new creation. You can't just be slightly repaired. You can't just be kintsugui'd, katsugui, kins, kinsa, whatever. You have to be fully, fully restored. And that only happens by the power of Jesus, right? Where he does this transformation supernaturally in our lives where we're no longer our old selves, but we have these new selves. And we're learning how to walk in this. But we have the joy that when we get to heaven, that's full glory. And so in Romans 8, he's talking about, hey, as a believer, you might go through suffering. And this is where it picks up. Um, for I consider that, and I'll, I'll just read this whole passage out first. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, there's a lot in this passage. There's a lot in even just reading it out. But I felt it was really important to read the whole passage out because I know God can already start speaking to you through that. But some of the key ideas that come out through this is that in suffering, there's this longing for something right. And in that longing, it's not an empty hope. There's this hope that actually our God brings us to this place of fullness. But there's this other word that comes up a few times, groaning. And groaning is not, okay, so like in modern society, when you groan, yeah, it's the same as grumbling, right? He's not saying groaning, ugh. It's like yearning, longing for something so much, like anguishing of your heart and your, your groaning. And at the end, there's this idea of glory. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. No matter how bad or how broken this world is, no matter how bad the brokenness or the suffering that you are feeling right now, no matter how bad the brokenness and suffering we see through the wars in the society, they don't compare to the glory that God has for us. Like, that's the opening statement. Like, and, 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 and so as bad and as horrible as it is, instead of turning our, ways from that, our eyes from that, you say, gosh, that is horrible. God, can your redemptive goodness and glory far out, outweigh that, outsurpass that so much that it's not even comparable. Because that's what this is saying, that, that no matter how bad it was, the goodness 
and glory of God far outweighs it, makes it incomparable. Now, this happens, actually. You can, you can see this in small ways in your own life. I know people who are, were on the brink of divorce, and they hated each other. And then through God's redemptive power, they worked things out. That years later, when they look back, they're like, yeah, how, how was it even that I was so frustrated or so angry in this marriage? How was it so insufferable that now, actually, I don't feel that anymore? It's, it's amazing because you see the power of God's transformation take something even in that s- small instance, small to us compared to maybe a war or death, but seeing actually that God's goodness in that. You see people who have been struggling with an illness or someone even passing away, but still God's glory outweighing that pain. And there are times in our life where we feel like the pain is just so much, how could we ever face it? But the reality here is saying that pain is going to be so great especially if you have nowhere else to cry out to. In all of this, it's trying to push us, look, where else are you going to cry out to? Where else can you go? What else can soothe you? In this world, they turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, they turn to all sorts of things, but it doesn't satisfy, right? And there will be times when you cry out to God and you feel unsatisfied with his answer. You feel unsatisfied with him. But the beautiful thing about a relationship with God is that you can continue to cry out. The deeper the anguish, the louder the cry. When you look in the Bible, this is what you see in the relationship that people have with God. The woman who couldn't have children, weeping in the the temple, praying so desperately because her heart is yearning and God's goodness flowing through that. Abraham yearning and praying for God to withhold judgment on Sodom. And pleading with him. And yet God showing grace to Lot and his family. You understand, actually, and it's hard for us too, because when we see large-scale tragedies or we see large-scale pain, it's too overwhelming. You don't even know where to begin. But instead of shying away from that and just saying, okay, well, it is what it is. It's It's a sinful world. All true. Our hearts have to let that brokenness push us towards God to weep and to cry for him. The brokenness you see, the brokenness in this world, the brokenness you experience actually doesn't compare to the glory of God. This hope is what we, is, is, is this hope is what Paul is leading us towards, right? So it goes on. For the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now here, uh, Paul writes and he talks about creation like it's this, it's this uh, thing with its own like, life. But he essentially is saying all the brokenness that you see in this world, everything in this world, it knows that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's the same way that we know when we see something broken, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Injustice selfishness, wars, greed, all of that. We look at that and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And when you stop and you think about it in your own life, you think, oh, but am I personally greedy in cases? Am I personally selfish in cases? All of that's reflecting that this brokenness is everywhere. And it's so pervasive. That's why God can talk about, you know, if you're angry at your brother, that's like the same as murder. Because you know the same anger in your heart. We talk about things that happens in Auschwitz or in World War II. Like, how did they set, get to the point where suddenly we're going to kill all the Jews? Like, when did that become like, oh, yeah, that's an acceptable thing? Small seeds of hate can blossom into so much destruction. And all of us carry that brokenness as well in our hearts. So we can't walk around judging so much other people. But what we can do is anguish in our heart. That this is not the way it's supposed to be. God, don't let me have any hate or judgment or pride or anger in my heart because I don't want this to be the result of it. I want that new creation life in me so that I can always be alive in you. I don't want to somehow end up spiraling so far into a road. At the same time, when we see this brokenness in the world, we cry out, God, you see this brokenness. Don't let it stay like this. 
the hope of this is that actually the world's brokenness isn't eternal, right? What it's saying is all creation yearns for the day when it's over. Not wiped out of existence, but rather the sin and brokenness is wiped out of existence. Like, again, this is why Jesus is so beautiful. When Jesus raises from the dead and he comes back, it's not just his resurrection life. It's the fact that he conquered sin and death. And he begins this hope and a promise of a new age for us. Like, that, that hope for us, that's like, oh, my gosh, that's what I want. I want to be living in that new age, that new hope, that new life that is not weighed down by this brokenness anymore. But I'm alive in you, Christ. And I'm like, I want more and more to be transformed into your image so that I, too, can be a light to the world around us to say that there is hope. In the same way that I was redeemed, God will redeem you. That he can redeem and fix broken communities, broken societies, broken places. So for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This groaning, this is what I want to lean into. That our hearts and our souls really need to yearn, really, really need to yearn, like weep, cry out, for God's redemption to just cover over all those broken spaces. Like that's the gift and the power that he's given us. And yet we fight too often in the physical world and not enough in the spiritual world. But to be honest, most of us do not, none of that fighting. We do most of the times focusing on ourselves. But he's asking us, God, transform what is spiritual in my life so that I pray with your power, but move me so that I might work for you here in the physical. So that, that story that we heard first about Naaman, like the little Bible story, like what, what happens here? That is a perfect example of brokenness. This man is afflicted with this disease. That is brokenness. That's what we see when you see someone who had cancer. You look at that person and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. When the scans come back and you see their whole body is riddled with cancer, you think that's not the way it's supposed to be. Something is broken. And so this little girl who sees her master afflicted with this, in her simplicity of her heart, she's like, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Something's broken. She should go see this prophet so that he can get healing. And he's like, oh, I don't know, I'm too proud. But actually, God works with that thing. Let, let me go. Let me go to him. So he goes to them. He says, wash in the water seven times, right? Eventually he does. When he comes back, he's like, whoa, what has been transformed physically in my life has made me yearn for God. Like physically he's transformed, but his soul is transformed. He goes back and he's like, oh, man, dude, I got to pay you for all this. And Elijah's like, no, it's not me. It's, it's God. And what does he do? He immediately turns all the glory and praise to God. But you see actually in that healing, he's completely transformed. What was broken isn't broken anymore. Now for us, for us, it means we have that same power and authority to go out and be ambassadors of hope to this broken world. To the people around us to speak the truth of Jesus in it and say, actually, I want to pray for you. Because the brokenness that you experience, my Jesus fixes it. Because he's fixed brokenness in my life. And so I want to pray for you to have that brokenness fixed in yours. And you do that because you are saying, I know Jesus is this one. I know Jesus can do that. But we don't do that because we're scared. We tell ourselves, well, what if it doesn't happen? That's not our, our, our focus is to bring hope and the truth of Jesus to this world. It's yearning for wholeness. When we hear about someone who's sick or a family who's grieving, like the best way is you come alongside them and you grieve with them. You cry out to God for the same thing. Because you yearn for what was broken to be restored to wholeness. And you know you don't have the power to do that alone. So we cry out to God. We yearn for that wholeness in people's lives. And for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he has seized? 
But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. I mean, I think this is very obvious, but I don't think we ever think about this. Like, normally when we hope, we want to hope, like, we want to play the odds, right? Okay, so I know you know, a lot of Chinese people like gambling, right? We want to play the odds. We're hoping that the next card that's drawn is going to be the one. We hope the next Mahjong tile you pick up is going to be the one you want. I'm not saying you should play cards or Mahjong. Um, but, like, we're hoping for something that's unseen, but in our heads we've tried to count how many tiles are left or who's taking what, right? We're trying to pl plot the best way forward, right? We're hoping. It's not too different here, actually, because if you're hoping in God, your hope is not blind hope. It's just not necessarily realized at the moment. But our hope is in our God who is immense, who is supernatural, who is all-powerful, who has done miraculous things, who has raised you from the dead, who has fixed brokenness in small ways in your life, and then you've heard about it fixed in people in big ways in their lives, who has brought salvation to the world. So our hope is in him. And so we cry out to him, and we wait patiently. Because what else are you going to do? Again, I, I think about uh, my friend, my Ukrainian friend. I think about that the war goes on. And she waits patiently for this war to end. And that, that hope is difficult because he's, um, some days it sounds like Russia's taking more land. Other days it sounds like no one's giving them weapons. And, and this whole situation, you look at it and you go, it's broken. Same Israel and Palestine, it's all broken. You look at their politics, it's broken, and you can spiral into this bowl of cynicism and just say, well, it's all just broken. Burn the world, right? Which is basically what half of America is saying now. Just burn the world. There's no Christ in that. And that's not what Christ wants either, right? Because I tell you, like, if I was God, right, we would have killed everyone. I would have wiped the whole civilization out because these guys are a mess. And yet Jesus, in his amazing love, chooses to redeem us and offer a way to wholeness. That, Jew, that Hebrew word shalom, that's totality, not just peace, wholeness in your life. So again, us as Christians, what are we doing? We're saying, yes, God, that wholeness, I want that. Not for myself. Yes, for myself. But I want it so much for this person. It becomes a person-by-person person thing. Where we're, we're talking to the people that we know and praying for them and asking God to heal that brokenness and restore them and continually to lean into that and hope and wait patiently and never giving up. Hope in Christ, that's our yearning. Because we know who Christ is and we know what he can do. What's even greater is that our groaning is not our own. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Yesterday at Kairos, and we did this young adult conference, and we had... Uh, young adults from all across the country come and join us. And I got to catch up with a, an old friend of mine uh, who I'd seen once at a youth conference. And she shared some uh, challenges she was going through. And then she drifted away from church. And we had a good time to catch up. Um, and she's sharing about how God transformed one of her friendships. And her heart was broken so much so for this person. And she was sharing that she had this dream that actually God was saying, the brokenness that you feel for this person is just a drop of how much God feels for this person. When we see the brokenness of someone, that comes because God has put that in our heart, which means God sees it so much more, and his heart breaks so much more for that. Every love that you have for someone, God loves that person even greater. Like, we have just a tiny drop of it. So this passage is saying, look, the Spirit is prompting in your heart to pray for these things. And he's saying, that love that you have, that injustice that you feel, God senses it and knows it a gazillion times more. And he's inviting us to be part of the Spirit's desire to pray victory into those situations. We have this opportunity to partner into the healing and the brokenness of this world. So for some of us here, our hearts are broken all the time for so many things around the world. Others of us, our hearts are broken so specifically for certain people. Do you know where that comes from? It's not your own goodness that's bringing this to light. 
It's God saying, this is on my heart, and I want you to pray for these things. I want you to weep and cry and break through into these things. Because those prayers transform things. So whatever situation you've been through, and you might have been through brokenness in your life, and God's brought you through that. He gives you that to say, you understand, so you will pray truth into those places. You will pray the hope of Jesus into those places. Our responsibility then is to be, okay, God, yes, speak into my life. Open my eyes. Show me what is broken and let me not be satisfied with that. Don't let me keep driving around with a Porsche that has a hole in its bottom or a car that needs to open its door to listen to the music. God, restore it. And you start really praying for these things. And you start really asking God to transform them. And your boldness moves forward because you're like, actually, God, I... I want to pray out loud for this person right now. I want to pray out loud in this situation. I want to find people who want to pray as well because just being mad about it is not what God is calling us to do. God is calling us to join with him and his spirits yearning and groaning for the truth of what he's doing. The spirit yearns even deeper than ourselves. This last part just says that actually at the end, all of this is going to be ended up. God is faithful to his promises, to his truth. And he will be brought into this place of glory. And that glory is wholeness, right? So when I think about the brokenness, when I think about those suffering in Palestine, in Gaza, in Ukraine, I think about those suffering in Russia, in China, in Israel. Suffering in those parts of the world we don't hear about, we know there's suffering going on. For the poverty here in Britain, for those riddled with drugs or alcohol problems, for the friends that we have that are suffering with health issues, cancer, tumors, mental health, it can be so overwhelming. So what we do is ask God, okay, God. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And I, your heart, God, is broken for everything. But show me what you want my heart to be broken for. And instead of just carrying that around and being frustrated, pray. Find places to speak his life into people. Pray out loud with other people. Because as you do that, you can see God begin to work and transform. Because the hope that we have is not empty. Jesus is Lord over this broken world. And his death and resurrection prove it. It proves that he is already victorious over these things. It's because in that he makes a way for redemption for us to be saved. We don't end with these pictures of this. We end with pictures of his restoration. Even in places of injustice and hope, we don't run away from that brokenness. But we cry out to God even more for his redemption. I just want to end with this verse. And this is Jesus, when he first arrives in ministry, what does he say? He quotes this passage from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And when Jesus says this, when he's talking about this year, this age of the Lord's favor has come because he has conquered the brokenness of this world. And he invites us to be on a journey to see this redemption, knowing that culminates in perfection in heaven. So we pray healing, victory, and power of Jesus into brokenness. And we do it one person at a time. Boldly praying out loud for those around us. Saying, Jesus, don't let it be this way. Don't let this brokenness stay this way in this family, in this friendship, in this life. Groan, yearn, pray, pour out, lament, cry out. Don't let your hearts become hard. But really yearn for God. Shall we pray and then we'll come to a time of communion. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much because you are victorious. And there's far too often we don't remember your victory. We become very complacent in just praying for small things in our life when really actually your spirit is calling us to see the brokenness in the world and participate with you in your healing and victory. Jesus, wake us up from our slumber. You are Lord over this broken world, and you invite us to be part of the victory that you are shaping over. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
as you come to a time of communion, this is the perfect space to already bring any brokenness that you have or brokenness that you see in this world and say, Jesus, this blood and this bread remind us of your victory. His blood and his body was broken for us, and yet he resurrected, saying that his victory over sin and death was total and complete. If you're a believer and baptized, we invite you to take the communion with us. The stewards are coming around. If you just raise your hand, if you didn't pick one of these up on the way in, and you can just take, take it now. If you've got one, take a few moments to just confess your sins, maybe your own sense of pride, your own doubts, your own fears. But just surrender that all to God now and say, God, I want to be used by you to move forward from brokenness into the wholeness that you offer. Let's just be still. Lord Jesus, we offer ourselves to you. We surrender our journey to you, Lord. We thank you because you are victorious over us, Lord, and your grace washes over us so that we no longer live in brokenness, Lord, but you are redeeming and moving us forward in your path of holiness and wholeness in you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. I invite you now to open up the top layer of the cup, and we'll take the bread and eat together as a symbol of unity. After supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this is my blood poured out for you as a new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance of me. In the same way, remember what Jesus has done on the cross opens up a new promise for us, one that brings us into his glory and his goodness. I invite you to open up the cup layer, and we'll take it together as a symbol of unity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, fill us again with your spirit. We know that it already indwells in us, Lord, but we uh, ignite that fire in our heart for your name, for your goodness, for your power, for your mercy, for your glory. We want to be living disciples of you, Lord, not slowly decaying one, Lord. Continue to shape us and move us, Lord. Let's not be satisfied with brokenness, but let's yearn for your wholeness in every situation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the worship team comes up and the stewards collect the cup, I invite you to use this time to really worship and bring any brokenness that you feel or struggle with to the Lord as we come to his altar. If you'd like to receive prayer or feel like something in particular in your heart, I'll be up in the front, happy to pray with you. Let's come and worship.
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much because you are hope in life and in death. So, Lord, let's be witnesses and ambassadors of that hope to this world around us. We thank you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you again for joining us. I look forward to seeing you guys next week.